Well, good morning. morning. Did y'all practice that? (laughs) And I heard somebody say aloha. Yes, uh, Chris and I just got back from uh, vacation. Uh, The first time we have spent more than three days on vacation without our children since Eli was born. So uh, 19 and a half years, and uh, I started, we we got off the plane, and I turned to Chris, and I said, hi, I'm Stephanie. (laughs) Uh, But we had a wonderful time, and Rachel had a great time in Honduras for her uh, service trip with Anacortes, or with the Rotary Yes program. And Eli stayed home and fed the cats and worked. It's becoming a grown-up, right? (laughs) So a warm welcome to any of you who are joining us online. You'll find the link for the worship aids there, and we're glad that you're joining us. And at the end of your pew, you'll find the communication cards you can sign, letting us know that you're here today, any updated information you'd like to share with us. And then in the offering plates that are in the back or right here in the front, you can drop them off along with your offering at the end of the service. I think we have coffee hour today, yes? I think so, yes. I think the Sharbacks are doing that. So um, look forward to welcoming you downstairs in our fellowship hall at the end of the service. And I want to have an exceedingly warm welcome for Jean Chaumont, who's with us today to lead in worship. Welcome, Jean. Uh, I know Jean, uh, as of this morning, but through his wife, Andrea, who is a clergy colleague in Northwest Coast Presbytery. I've interacted with her several times, and uh, Jean had the opportunity to lead one of our um, Verge experiences and talk about jazz music and, and music as a way to connect with the heart of God, and we're glad to welcome him to lead worship this morning. The plan was for him and uh, Andrea to both be here today, and they have a sick little one, and so he's flying solo. So your encouragement and participation, I'm sure, will be a a great boost to him. Welcome, Sean. We're glad to have you. Let's pray, and then Ember will call us to worship. Come on, Ember. Lord God, we are so grateful for this day to be alive in it, to worship you, to gather with our sisters and our brothers. Lord, receive the sacrifice of praise that we bring to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes. Would you please stand in the call to worship? How precious is your steadfast love, O God. All people may take refuge refuge in the shadow of your wings. For with you is the fountain of life. stay standing if you can. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see to see you. 
Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Oh, I your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy holy, holy, holy holy, holy, holy holy, holy, holy I want to see Focus ourselves on you. You're the reasons why we breathe, and you're the reason uh, why we're here this morning.
You may be seated. God is my shepherd, I won't be wanting, I won't be wanting. He makes me rest in fields of green with quiet stream. Even though I walk through the valley of death and dying, I will not fear, cause you are with me. shepherd I won't be wanting I won't be wanting He makes me rest in fields of green with quiet streams Even do I walk our sins to the Lord. Lord Jesus, we confess that we have sinned more times than we can or care to remember. We know our faulty memories aren't the way to forgiveness and new life, so we bow before you and we name the truth we know, that we have fallen short of your glory. Good and gracious God, deliver us from every sinful habit, every interest of former sins, everything that dims the brightness of your grace in us, everything that prevents us taking delight in you. We pray in the saving name of Jesus. Amen. Friends, believe the good news. In Christ we are forgiven, and that brings us peace. The peace of Christ be with you. 
If you care to turn to your neighbor and share the peace of Christ. I'd like to invite the children to gather here, and I'm going to tell you a story. Um, And while they're coming and gathering, I just want to do a shout out, a a brag on our family ministries committee, uh, Sarah Vandervoort and Clara Morris, who for the last two Thursday afternoons have gone out to Washington Park to greet any kids that might be there and provide them with a, a craft project, a beach hunt, Um, The first Thursday, they had seven kids that they interacted with. Uh, this uh, This past Thursday, they had 20 kids that they were interacting with. So, awesome. And that's to say that if you have kids and Thursday afternoon you would like to go out to Washington Park, you can find them there. Uh, If you have neighbor kids you want to recommend, or if you just like to lend a hand, if you like going to the beach and getting painty or something like that, I know that they would love, love to have your help. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. How are you today? Good. I want to tell you, a story about two times, two running races that I participated in. The first one was my first cross-country meet when I was a sophomore, my second year in high school. I joined the cross-country team. And I practiced with them, and I practiced, and we ran, and our our races were a 5K, 3.1 miles. Okay, And during practice, I ran with some other girls. We were uh, usually at the end of the group that would go out. And at my first race, we were at Bellevue State Park in northern Delaware. That's where I grew up. It was a pretty flat course. And so when it was time for JV to go, they said, I don't know, I don't think they shot a gun. They said, ready, set, go. And we all started running on this course. And as I was running, the the girls that I was used to running with, it was like somebody had given them spinach for breakfast. They were running so fast, and I wasn't. And like pretty soon, I didn't know where anybody was. I kind of knew how the course went, so I just followed the course, and I ran, 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 and I ran. And finally, I got back to the big parking lot for the end of the race, And you know what I saw at the end of the race? I saw the school bus with all of my teammates pulling out of the parking lot to drive back 11 miles to Newark, which is where I was from. Do you know how hard it is to run fast (laughs) when you've already run about as fast as you think you can go? Do you know how awkward it is to run over medians in parking lots and try to shout when you're as exhausted as as you possibly can be? And there was somebody in the back of the bus. Have you ever ridden the bus and you know those back windows? And I heard that this is what they said. Hey, Coach Davies, looks like Stephanie's chasing the bus. (laughs) So the bus stopped. I started walking at that point. I thought they could wait on me a little bit longer. And I got on the bus, and I didn't talk to anybody on the way home. I was so demoralized. I was so depressed. I was so embarrassed. That night, when I got home, I couldn't even tell my mom what had happened. I was so embarrassed. Then the phone rang, and I heard her talking. And she said things like, oh, hi, Coach Davies. No, she didn't mention anything like that. Well, thank you for calling. We, un- we understand and we forgive you, right? Because he had call- called to apologize because he thought everybody was on the bus and I was still running. And he was like, let's go back to Newark, and I was still running, and he apologized. Okay, that's my sophomore year, my first race in cross country. Can I tell you about my last race in co- cross country? We were at Brandywine, 
Brandywine State Park, which was super hilly. And you started and you ran down this big, 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 big hill, and then you ran through the woods. And then you come back and you run back up the hill to the end of the race. And so they said, go, and the girls ran, and again, they had spinach, and I was like, just running. This was my last race. I knew I was never going to run cross country again. And up until this time, every race I ran in, I got last place. I didn't ever have to chase the bus anymore, but every time I ran, like 14 meets over all these years, Stephanie, last place. Stephanie, last place. Stephanie, last place. So this last race, what do you think I want to do? (laughs) Ember, you are so ambitious, and I love that about you. The truth was, I just didn't want to come in last again. (laughs) She's like, oh, oh, yeah. (laughs) So get to the bottom of the big hill back up, right? And I see a girl who's like running, (laughs) but not very fast. I think she might have been severely injured. I'm not sure. (laughs) But I decided I was going to beat her. And for me, not coming in last was going to be like coming in first. And so I'm running up this hill. It was probably more like this. And because everybody on my team who had already finished was at the top of the hill, and they could see me down at the bottom of the hill, and they could see this girl too, like a light bulb went off. And they were like, Stephanie might not come in last today, right? So guess what they did? They ran all the way down to the bottom of the hill. And the entire varsity and JV boys and girls team ran with me up that hill. And at the last minute, I passed her. And I did not come in last. And I was like, I wanted a trophy for second to last place. But there wasn't a trophy. But I told you I was really demoralized and sad and embarrassed the first race, how do you think I felt before I finished my last race, when I was at the bottom of the hill and I hadn't seen that there was a girl close to me? How do you think I felt then, knowing it was my last race and I was in last place? I was demoralized, depressed, embarrassed, et cetera, right? Like, am I going to get up this hill, right? And then when I saw my whole team running down the hill, you know what I thought? I thought they're running for the bus, (laughs) right? And I was like, oh, man. And then when they circled around and they ran with me, I wasn't depressed anymore. I wasn't embarrassed anymore. And they they had, like, breath left to run up the hill again and say things like, come on, you can do it. Come on, come on. And they cheered for me the whole way. And it was like we were a team all together, and they were encouraging me. And, you know, I took all that time to tell that sort of funny story on myself because it makes me think of Paul in the Bible who talks about that living a life of faith is like running a race. And sometimes we're like crossing the finish line number one and we feel great. And sometimes we're bringing up the rear and we're embarrassed and we think we don't have any energy and how are we going to get up that hill? And then lo and behold, The Spirit of God is like the team that comes and makes the corner and runs with you as you run that final part and says, come on, Stephanie, come on, Matt, come on, Belle, come on, Amber, you can do it. And so Paul talks about living life like it's a race. And I don't worry anymore about coming in last place because I know that God is with me and the Holy Spirit is going to give me the encouragement I need even if. I have to chase the bus. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, thank you for funny, embarrassing stories that can help us uh, know you and your presence in our lives better. Thank you for the Apostle Paul, who uh, ran a strong race, but also had times of being 
demoralized and discouraged. And thank you for the way that your promises to him uh, empowered him to, to keep running, to keep going, and to keep sharing the good news of Jesus. We want to be like him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You can get your um, worship binders if you didn't grab one already, and or you can return to the playground, and we'll see you next time. Scripture reading, Psalm 119, 33 through 40. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your status, and I will observe it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your comm commandments, for I, delight it, for I delight in it. Turn to my heart to your degrees and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at vanities. Give me life in your ways. Confirm to your servant, your, your servant, your promise, which is for those who fear you. Turn away from the disgrace that I dread, for ordinances are good. See, I have longed for your precepts. In your righteousness, give me life. I pray to you that you will hear Stephanie's words and that we will respect and honor God's words. Amen. It was just an amazing job you did, Ember. Thank you. She's back from vacation, too. Well rested. Um... I want to say thank you to those of you who were here for the last two weeks when we had some bumps while I was gone. You know, as a pastor, you think you put everything into place. You uh, find somebody to do pulpit supply, and then the day that you're getting on a plane, they call and they say, I have COVID. Um, <laughs> and then uh, they record sermons. They uh, rely on Savannah for technology. And so I want to say thank you to Jan for really stretching in pursuing the technology of recording her sermons and being willing to do that when she didn't feel well. And then you, the congregation, for receiving that and any of the other bumps. We had um, kind of the perfect storm of all of our staff sort of on vacation at the same time, and we weathered it well. And so that's one thing I say about this congregation. We know how to do worship. We know how to come together. We know how to support one another. Um, and so that just brings me great joy. And then thank you for the anniversary cards that were in my mailbox when I got back. Today is the day of my 27th anniversary at Westminster. I moved to, I, we moved to Anacortes at the end of June, but I asked that my official start date would be July, I think it was July 8th that year. Um, Anybody know why I wanted to start on July 8th? Any guesses? The first Sunday of the month at that point in time was Communion Sunday. And like heck, I was going to graduate from seminary and start by presiding at the table. I was so worried I was going to spill something. I took care of that two months later. Um, so, but I said I would start on the second, second Sunday of July, and um, it's been amazing. So thank you for that. Uh, this summer, we have been studying our way through the Apostle Paul's missionary journeys that Luke chronicles in the book of Acts. 
And today we come to the end of his second missionary journey. So far in this series, we've acknowledged the important role that the Spirit as the mover and the shaker that opens doors for Paul and his companions. She leads and guides them through the ups and downs of presenting the gospel in Asia Minor and then on into Europe. This, this is Jesus' ascension promise coming to fruition. Before he ascended, he promised them that the Spirit would come and be with them and give them power, dunamis power, dynamite power, and they would be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, last time we were together, we were reading Acts 17 about Paul's time in Athens and how he used his working knowledge of their poets and their philosophers and the many idols that he found spread out through the city to introduce them to God. And through the Spirit's work through Paul, a few folks in Athens became believers. So now we're going to pick up our story in Acts 18, where once again, Paul, through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, is on the move again. I'll be reading from Acts 18, the first 22 verses. That's on page 121 in the Pew Bible, if you'd like to follow along there. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And there he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they worked together. By trade, they were tent makers. Every Sabbath, Paul would argue in the synagogue and would try to convince Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with proclaiming the word, testifying to the Jews that the Messiah was Jesus, and when they opposed and reviled him in protest, he shook the dust from his clothes and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And then he left the synagogue and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the official of the synagogue, became a believer in the Lord together with all his household, and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul became believers and were baptized. One night, the Lord said to Paul in a vision, Do not be afraid, but speak. Do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will lay a hand on you to harm you, for there are many in this city who are my people. So Paul stayed there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal. They said, this man is persuading people to worship God in ways that are contrary to the law. Just as Paul was about to speak, Galileo said to the Jews, if it were a matter of crime or serious villainy, I would be justified in accepting the complaint of you Jews. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see it to it yourselves. I do not wish to be a judge of these matters. And he dismissed them from the tribunal. And then all of them seized Sosthenes, the official of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Galileo paid no attention to any of these things. After staying there for a considerable time, Paul said farewell to the believers and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. At Centria, he had his hair cut, for he was under a vow. When they reached Ephesus, he left them there, but first he himself went into the synagogue and had a discussion with the Jews. When they asked him to stay longer, he declined, but on taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills. And then he set sail from Ephesus. When he had landed at Caesarea, he went up to Jerusalem and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In Corinth, 
Paul meets a couple, Aquila and Priscilla. Aquila is originally from Pontus, which is near the Black Sea in what is modern Turkey. But most recently, he and Priscilla have come to Corinth from Rome because Emperor Claudius has expelled all the Jews from Rome. And so Paul links in with them, Luke tells us, because they shared a similar occupation. They were tent makers. In the original Greek, it's better translated as leather workers, but they were working the leather to make tents. And so Paul begins ministry in Corinth with some newfound friends. He later mentions them by name in his letter to the Romans. In that letter, he says, Greet Prissa and Aquila, who work with me in Christ Jesus and who risk their necks for my life. He holds these, this couple in high, high regard. And Paul begins his missionary efforts exactly where we expect him to. And where is it that we expect that Paul will begin his missionary efforts in Corinth? In the synagogue, yes, we're paying attention. Every Sabbath, he's in the synagogue speaking, presenting, making a case for Jesus to the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles that he would meet there. By this time, we recognize that Paul is rather predictable in what he does when he arrives in a new place. However, each new place that he travels to is different. And so it dictates to some extent how he's going to go about presenting the gospel. The transition between Athens, where his listeners were heady, thoughty, intellectual, philosophical kinds of people, and Corinth is going to be very noticeable. If we take a look at this map, you see Corinth. I put an orange star there. Athens is over to the right. And this is all part of modern-day Greece, the lower part and the part off to the right. Um, the big mass that looks like it has fingers, uh, that's the Peloponnesian Peninsula. And so the little tiny land area that connects the, the continental part or the, the, the larger land mass of, of Europe um, is connected to the Peloponnesian Peninsula through the Corinthian Isthmus. That's really hard to say, Isthmus. And um, it connects at, at the smallest point there. It's just about four miles across. And um, Paul goes there, and he's in Corinth. And Corinth, at the time that Paul visited, was much larger than Athens. It was about 20 times bigger than Athens. Uh, historians suggest there were probably as many as 20,000 people who lived in Corinth when Paul visited. Why? We'll take a look at this. So the isthmus, right, is a connecting part. And if we were to see the larger map of Europe, any trade by boat or by ship that would have come from Italy or from the Adriatic to get over to the Aegean Sea um, towards Athens or farther over towards uh, Asia Minor uh, would have gone, had to go around 200 miles around the Peloponnesian Peninsula. Um, and so what they did instead was, it was there was a, ra a rolling railway where boats would come in through the Gulf of Corinth and then they would unload all of their cargo and that would get rolled that 3.9 miles across the, the teensiest part of land there to over where the Saronic Gulf is. And they would put the boat on these rollers too. And so they'd roll the boat and the cargo. They'd skip 200 miles of sailing and Bob's your uncle and wonderful, right? They, they skipped all that sailing. Um, the next picture shows us the Corinth Canal today. Right? Have any of you ever been to the Corinth, uh, Corinthian Canal? It's pretty amazing. Um, Julius Caesar was the first person to think that a canal there would be a good idea. He had the thought. Uh, Emperor Nero 
quote, started the project, but didn't get very far. It was started in earnest in 1882 and completed in 1893, finally providing a waterway that co connected the Gulf of Corinth to the Aegean. The canal varies in width somewhere between 70 to 80 feet wide, and it has a water depth of 25 feet. But in Paul's day, there was no waterway access. It was just that, that roller railway that was in use. And so Corinth became this huge transportation hub connecting the north and the south and the east and the west. And it was known for four main reasons. First, it was known for its bronze work. Corinthian bronze workers were renowned throughout the region. The 75-foot-tall bronze beautiful gate at Herod's temple was fashioned from Corinthian bronze. So Corinth, known for its bronze. Uh, the second thing, it was known for its architecture. Have you studied ancient Greek architecture and all the different columns, right? And so the, the pl most plain was the Doric, and then the Ionian, and then finally the most intricate, the Corinthian, uh, mounted at the top. You can see the fancy work at the top of those columns. And this is a picture of Corinth uh, today. Um, so they were known for bronze. They were known for architecture. They were known for their sports. They were the host city for the, wait for it, Isthmian Games, second only in size to the Olympic Games. So Corinth of the day, known for uh, bronze, known for architecture, known for athletics, known for being a travel hub, um, but perhaps its greatest reputation was for its immorality and its debauchery. During Paul's day, if you said that someone was acting like a Corinthian, it meant that they were engaging in sexual immorality. There was a phrase of uh, a euphemism, a, a Corinthian companion. Who might she be? <laughs> that was a, a euphemism for a, a prostitute. And a common saying or proverb of the day was, not every fella can afford a trip to Corinth. Because the implication was you would be going to Corinth for a very specific reason that you would need money for. Okay? So that's what Corinth was. One more slide. Um, actually, can you go back, Will? In the background, this is Corinth that is in the low plain area, closer to where the canal is today. And the mountain on top is what they call Acro Corinth. And now if you could give us that, Will. And you can see that it's built up in, onto the mountain. And at the very top, um, there was the temple to Aphrodite. Um, and she was the Greek goddess associated with love, lust, beauty, pleasure, uh, passion, procreation, our English word aphrodisiac comes from her name. And during Paul's day, it's estimated that there may have been as many as 1,000 temple prostitutes that were associated with the temple of Aphrodite there on the top of the mountain. So this is the environment of the city of Corinth that Paul enters when he leaves Athens. If Athens was a city for the head, the mind, and thoughts, well, Corinth was a city for body and for pleasure. But in Paul's case, it was synagogue preaching and tent making. And so is it any wonder that he receives a lackluster welcome when he arrives in Corinth? Silas and Timothy show up, and Paul is making an absolute hash of it. Listen to the verbs that Luke uses to describe Paul's actions. He argues for, he seeks to convince, he proclaims, he testifies. And then how does Luke describe the response that he gets from the Corinthian people? They oppose, they revile, they protest, they... Um, seek to do him harm. And Paul declares in this sort of fit of, of passionate frustration, he says, I'm giving up on the Jews. 
Um, now I'm going to go focus on my ministry on the Gentiles. And we're going to want to pay attention as we keep reading in the book of Acts to see if he follows through with that promise and or threat. So Paul leaves the synagogue. He pops in next door uh, and has a meaningful ministry contact with Titius Justus, uh, Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his household, and many other Corinthians, it says, became believers. But still, this, these first 22 verses of chapter 18 leave us with the impression that Paul is demoralized. He's discouraged. Bible teacher Skip Heitzig from Albuquerque, New Mexico, reminds us that discipleship, or in Paul's case, apostleship, always equals hardship. And his quote is, discipleship, apostleship, and hardships, these ships always sail together. And so this is the end of what we would call Paul's second missionary journey. At this point, he doesn't know that he's going to take another one, so maybe we should evaluate how it's gone. Well, let's review. Starts out, remember he goes up into the province of Asia. He has a vision to preach the gospel. The Holy Spirit shuts that down. He tries to go to Bithynia. They shut that down. The Holy Spirit does. He ends up at Troas, that's at the very, very top, sort of in the middle. Uh, he has a vision of a Macedonian man coming, pleading to, for Paul to come and to help. And so they get in a boat, and when they land in Philippi, there's no man, <laughs> there's no synagogue. They find Lydia, some other women. They get beaten with rods. They get thrown in jail for the night. Then they go on to Thessalonica, that's also off the screen, right? And uh, there Paul preaches, the town is in an uproar, they attack Jason, his host, and so Paul and company get the bums rush out of Thessalonica, they head to Berea, the reception there is a little more hospitable, that is until the riotous Thessalonians show up and push them out of Berea. And the helpful Bereans sneak Paul down to Athens, where he gives these nice, heady arguments in the marketplace, in the Areopagus, where his listeners, for the most part, just scoff at the idea of the resurrection of the dead. But a few people come to faith. Paul's second missionary journey doesn't really feel like a Billy Graham crusade. Like, the people aren't rushing down in the aisles to come to Jesus. And now Paul is stuck in Sin City. Corinth needs help. And so does Paul. And that help comes to him in a vision, a dream that he has at night. God, in verse 9, Luke says, tells Paul three things during that night. Don't be afraid. Keep at it. Don't be silent. And so to a deflated, demoralized Paul, these come as words of inspiration. And then God follows up with three promises. The first is, I am with you. That's the very thing Jesus said as he gave the Great Commission. I am with you to the end of the age. God is promising Paul the divine presence. He's not alone. God is with him. The second thing God says is, no one will lay a hand on you to harm you. Have you read the rest of the book of Acts? <laughs> I think this is very specific to, to, to Corinth, and God is promising him protection there. And the third is that there are many people in this city who are my people, God says. So God has a plan for Paul, something he's supposed to do in Corinth, to do ministry there in Sin City. And those promises, remarkably, are enough for Paul. He stays in Corinth for a year and a half. 
he later writes two letters to them, pastoring to them through the written word even after he's gone from them. And so I just want to close today by reminding each one of us that I believe that God has similar promises for us as well, where we are here. God has promised God's presence and God's protection, and God has a plan for us in this city, in Anacortes, in this town where we are. And so when we grow demoralized, when we're defeated, embarrassed, stuck at the bottom of the hill, panting for air, um, God's got our back. Through the power of the Spirit, God makes the turn and joins us on that uphill journey. That was true for Paul, and I believe it's true for each one of us. So shall we pray together? Almighty God, your son Jesus, named Emmanuel, God with us. How we crave your presence, God. Remind us that you are with us. Remind us also of your protection. And help us to recognize that doesn't always mean what we think it might mean. And God, for, for those of us who live in this community, or in whatever community we live in, how awesome it is for us to be included in your plan. And so help us to, to be encouraged and to see what that plan is and to stick with it, trusting that you are running with us. We pray with thanksgiving in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. This morning as we continue uh, in worship, as we pray for one another, a couple updates I wanted to share with you. Uh, we're praying for Bonnie and Les Ilkema. Bonnie had a fall and broke her leg and had surgery down in Harborview to pin that all together. And then in that same week, uh, Les had a gallbladder attack and went to the hospital and had his gallbladder taken out. And they're recovering together at Soundview. And so we want to uh, pray for them. Molly McIntosh is having her surgery tomorrow. So we want to lift her up in prayer. Are there other people, uh, places, conditions that you'd like to lift up in prayer this morning? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we come before you and we trust you. And because we trust you, we have the confidence to bring before you people and places and situations that Maybe we don't know what to do, but we want and we trust you to do what you know needs to happen in those situations. We pray for healing for our friends mentioned and those that we did not mention, but who remain in our hearts. We pray for those who are traveling this summer. We ask that you would be with them that you would remind them that you are with them and that you would return them safely to us. We give you thanks for our ministry here in this community. We thank you for the wonderful report of uh, beach meetups out at Washington Park and the children of this community that we're reaching and interacting with. Uh, we thank you for Sarah and for Clara and for their witness there. We pray, God that as we conclude our worship today, that your spirit would go with us, would hem us in before and behind, and that we would have and feel your strength as you walk with us. We pray in Jesus' holy name and join our voices in the prayer he taught us, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. 
for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Now it is time for the offering. Offering plates are in the back and up here by the door. There are other ways to give on the screen. Please just play with me, pray with me for our offering. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you that you have plans for me that are for my good and your glory. You said, give me, give, and it will be given to you. For in the same measure as you give, it will be given to you again. We give to you today as a response to your goodness to us. We ask that you receive our offerings and continue to supply all our needs. May your peace be in our hearts, your grace be in our words, your love be in our hands, and your joy be in our souls. In your mighty name, amen. stand. ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you we live for you Jesus the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Only there is no one like you. There is none besides you. Open up my eyes. Wonder and show me who you are and feel me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. of every song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you we live for you Jesus the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Only there is no one like you. There is none besides you. Open up my eyes. Yeah. 
much for driving up I-5 and being with us today. Merci. We're glad to have you. <laughs> Coffee hour downstairs. We'd love to visit with you there. Go in peace and serve the Lord. May the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you now and forever. And all God's people said, amen. amen.